the elixir of life, a mythical potion said to grant eternal life and youth to those who drink it, has captured the imaginations of people across various cultures and throughout history. The concept of this life-giving elixir can be traced back to ancient Mesopotamia, where the epic tale of a legendary king recounts his search for a plant at the bottom of the sea that could restore youth. In ancient China, the pursuit of immortality was a common theme among rulers, who sent alchemists on expeditions to find the elixir of life. The Chinese believed that consuming long-lasting minerals such as jade, cinnabar, or gold could confer longevity. However, many of these substances were actually toxic and led to cases of alchemical elixir poisoning. In Hindu scriptures, the elixir of life is known as Amrita and is described as a substance that the gods and demons fought over in order to gain power and immortality. The idea of transmuting base metals into gold, a concept closely related to the elixir of life, also appears in ancient Indian texts. The Islamic world and European alchemical tradition also have their own versions of the elixir of life, often associated with the creation of the philosopher's stone. Some famous alchemists, such as a French scribe and nobleman living in the 18th century, have gained reputations as creators of the elixir. In Japan, folk tales speak of waters of rejuvenation possessed by the moon god, drawing parallels to the elixir of life. These stories also warn of the consequences of misusing such a powerful substance. Throughout history, the elixir of life has been known by hundreds of names in different languages and cultures, each reflecting the universal human desire for immortality and eternal youth. Despite the many attempts to create this mythical potion, the elixir of life remains an elusive and tantalizing concept that continues to inspire the imagination. The Eliza effect, named after the 1966 chatbot Eliza, refers to the tendency of people to attribute human traits to computer programs, particularly those with textual interfaces. Eliza, developed by MIT computer scientist Joseph Weizenbaum, simulated a psychotherapist by rephrasing user input as questions. Users often ascribed understanding and empathy to Eliza's responses, despite knowing it was just a program. This phenomenon extends beyond Eliza to any situation where users perceive computer systems as having qualities beyond their actual capabilities, even when aware of the system's limitations. Researchers observed that users unconsciously assumed the chatbot's questions implied genuine interest and emotional involvement, even when they consciously knew the program was not capable of simulating emotions. This cognitive dissonance between the user's awareness of the program's limitations and their behavior towards its output is the key characteristic of the ELIZA effect. The discovery of the ELIZA effect was significant in artificial intelligence, showcasing the effectiveness of social engineering in human-machine interaction. It led to advancements in technologies simulating human behavior, such as general and specialized digital assistants. However, Weizenbaum cautioned against reducing all human thought to logical formalisms and warned about developing emotional attachments to machines anthropomorphized as humans. In the late 2010s, a controversial phenomenon emerged on YouTube and YouTube Kids involving videos that appeared to be child-friendly but contained disturbing themes inappropriate for young audiences. These videos often featured popular characters from family-oriented media, such as Disney's Frozen or Marvel superheroes, engaging in bizarre or unsettling behavior. The controversy, dubbed Elsagate, after the frequent appearance of the Frozen character Elsa in such videos, raised concerns about the ease with which inappropriate content could slip past YouTube's child safety algorithms. The videos often used keyword manipulation and misleading tags to circumvent content filters, making them difficult to moderate on the platform's large scale. Many Elsagate videos were produced using live-action footage or simple flash animation, with some even employing claymation or computer-generated imagery. The videos typically lacked dialogue, making them accessible to a global audience without language barriers. They often featured nonsensical or disturbing scenarios involving bodily functions, violence, or sexual themes. As the controversy gained public attention, some content creators came under scrutiny for channels featuring real-life children in potentially abusive or dangerous situations. 
One notable example was the channel Toy Freaks, which was terminated by YouTube after concerns were raised about the content creator's treatment of his young daughters. In response to the growing outrage, YouTube announced stricter guidelines regarding content featuring children and began aggressively deleting channels and videos that violated these policies. Despite these efforts, critics argued that the platform's algorithms remained ineffective at protecting young viewers from harmful content. The Elsagate controversy highlighted the challenges faced by YouTube in moderating the vast amount of content uploaded to its platform and the potential risks posed to children by videos masquerading as family-friendly entertainment. At the bottom of the sea, an unusual object captured in a photograph has sparked intrigue and speculation among those fascinated by the possibility of extraterrestrial artifacts. The image, taken by a research ship in the 1960s while surveying the seafloor west of Cape Horn, shows a peculiar structure reminiscent of an antenna, standing upright at a depth of nearly 13,000 feet. The object's striking resemblance to a modern antenna has led some proponents of fringe theories to suggest that it might be evidence of an alien presence on Earth. However, marine biologists have offered a more terrestrial explanation, identifying the mysterious object as a rare species of carnivorous sponge. This particular sponge species is known for its distinctive appearance, featuring a long stem with nodes and club-like appendages that bear an uncanny similarity to a microwave antenna. Illustrations of the sponge from the late 19th century depict it as a bush-like organism deeply rooted in the muddy seafloor. Despite the sponge's identification by experts, the photograph and its enigmatic subject have continued to capture the imagination of those drawn to the idea of underwater alien artifacts. Like this video and subscribe to Maker. The M-Drive is a concept for a spacecraft thruster that has captured the imagination of some inventors and garnered media attention, despite its apparent violation of the laws of physics. The basic idea behind the M-Drive is that it could generate thrust by reflecting microwaves inside a closed container without expelling any propellant. Several individuals have constructed prototypes based on this concept, each with their own design variations. Some have claimed to measure small amounts of thrust from their devices, leading to speculation about potential revolutionary applications in space travel. However, the scientific community has generally viewed these claims with skepticism, noting that a true reactionless drive would defy the fundamental principles of conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. Many physicists have argued that any apparent thrust measurements are more likely the result of experimental errors or unaccounted for forces. Over the years, various teams have attempted to replicate and test M-Drive prototypes, including researchers in China and at NASA's EagleWorks laboratory. While some experiments seem to indicate small amounts of unexpected thrust, Subsequent studies have suggested that these anomalies could be explained by external factors such as thermal effects or electromagnetic interactions. In 2021, a group of researchers in Germany published a series of papers detailing their efforts to rigorously test the M-Drive concept. After carefully isolating possible sources of error, they found no evidence of any measurable thrust, concluding that previous positive results were likely false positives. They went on to replicate several past experiments, demonstrating how the apparent thrusts could be fully accounted for by known sources of experimental error. Despite the lack of scientific support, the M-Drive concept continues to attract interest from those drawn to the idea of a revolutionary propulsion system. However, the consensus among experts remains that the device is fundamentally incompatible with our current understanding of physics and that any extraordinary claims of its efficacy would require extraordinary evidence to overturn this view. Emil Strenu, a Romanian general, is a notable figure in discussions surrounding geoengineering and geowarfare. His expertise sheds light on these complex topics, particularly regarding the potential use of geoweapons in response to natural disasters. General Strenu's distinction between geoweapons, which alter the environment for military purposes, and geoengineering, which manipulates it for various objectives, provides valuable insight into the field. 
His exploration of geoengineering encompasses a range of techniques, including those with military applications, such as carbon removal and solar radiation modification. One of the focal points of General Strenu's discourse is the HARP project, a controversial initiative suspected of clandestinely influencing climate conditions for military advantage. His investigation into HARP installations in various countries, notably the potent facility in the United States, has raised questions about its capabilities and potential implications. General Strenu's visit to HARP's Alaskan facility, despite its official guise as a university research center, has brought attention to its connections with the U.S. Army and CIA, prompting discussions about its diverse applications, from directed energy weaponry to space monitoring. Despite facing threats and multiple assassination attempts due to his outspoken views, General Strenu continues to contribute to the discourse on geoengineering and geowarfare, highlighting the potential risks and implications of these technologies. His analysis of the global landscape underscores the ongoing struggle between sovereigntist states and advocates of neo-progressivism or globalization, with secretive groups exerting significant influence behind the scenes. In regions like Eastern Europe, General Strenu's observations on Western agendas to fragment socialist states into smaller, more manageable entities, as evidenced by conflicts such as Kosovo, provide valuable perspective on geopolitical dynamics. While most people are raised to believe that ghosts are the spirits of the deceased returning to visit, there is another intriguing theory that suggests the living may be responsible for these paranormal occurrences. This idea proposes that our minds have the ability to leave behind emotional imprints or records of significant events, which can later manifest in the physical world long after we are gone. These emotional imprints, also known as residual energy or psychic imprints, are thought to occur when a person experiences a dramatic or traumatic event, causing their emotions to become so intense that they embed themselves into the surrounding environment. Much like a record player leaves grooves that can emit sounds under the right conditions, our minds could create a recording that can be played back when specific circumstances align. This concept has been explored in various forms of media, including a television production and a film, which have helped to popularize the idea and inspire people to reconsider the nature of ghosts. The theory suggests that historical repeaters, or apparitions that follow a consistent pattern without interacting with their surroundings, could be the result of a person's routine actions being imprinted on a location over an extended period. Traumatic experiences such as murders or car crashes are thought to generate enough energy to imprint the moment on the environment, resulting in the echoes of the past that we witness as hauntings. Some even believe that emotional imprints could be responsible for haunted objects, such as rocking chairs that move on their own or ghost ships, as a result of people pouring their love and affection into these items over the years. While the exact mechanism behind emotional imprinting remains unclear, it is speculated that it may be related to the electrical activity in our brains, particularly brain waves. Under certain circumstances, a surge in this activity could potentially create a unique form of energy capable of affecting the physical world. Psychics who claim to be able to sense past events and emotions may already possess the ability to interpret these embedded emotions, and if this power could be harnessed, it could have significant implications for criminal investigations and our understanding of the past. Empathy, a fascinating aspect of human interaction, goes beyond merely understanding others. It's about feeling and sharing their emotions. What makes it bizarre is its complexity and the way it blurs the lines between individuals. Imagine experiencing someone else's joy or pain as if it were your own. It's not just about understanding, it's about mirroring emotions, almost like a psychological echo. This ability to resonate with others, to step into their emotional shoes, can be both awe-inspiring and puzzling. Furthermore, empathy isn't limited to humans. It's observed in animals too, suggesting it's deeply ingrained in our evolutionary history. The fact that it starts to emerge in children as young as two years old adds another layer of intrigue. How do we instinctively grasp something so nuanced from such a young age? But perhaps what's most bizarre about empathy is its variability among individuals. Some people seem to effortlessly empathize, while others struggle. 
And while it's often associated with kindness and compassion, it can also lead to overwhelming distress, especially when one feels another's pain too deeply. Even our brains play a role in this oddity. Brain trauma can impair empathy, highlighting its intricate neural pathways. Yet, evidence suggests it's not just hardwired, empathy can be trained and cultivated, hinting at its malleable nature. In a world where empathy seems to be both a fundamental aspect of our humanity and a mysterious phenomenon, it's no wonder it continues to fascinate and perplex us. Joshua Abraham Norton, born in England in the early 19th century, eventually settled in San Francisco, California. Initially, he was a commodities trader and real estate speculator, but he faced financial ruin due to a failed rice market investment during a Chinese famine. In 1859, Norton proclaimed himself Emperor of the United States in a whimsical act. While he had no actual political power, people in San Francisco treated him with respect, and some businesses accepted currency issued in his name. Norton's eccentricity made him a beloved figure in the city, and he received free services and had his image featured on souvenirs. Norton's life took an interesting turn when he declared himself protector of Mexico after Napoleon III invaded Mexico. Despite lacking any formal authority, he issued decrees on various matters, including one that abolished the United States Congress. His actions ranged from visionary, like suggesting the League of Nations, to humorous, like imposing fines for saying Frisco. He also created his own currency, which some restaurants accepted, and he was known for his distinctive attire, often seen inspecting the city's streets and engaging in conversations with residents. Norton even intervened in anti-Chinese rallies in San Francisco. Throughout his reign, Norton engaged in foreign diplomacy, writing letters to foreign leaders, including Queen Victoria and Kamehameha V of Hawaii, in an attempt to foster relations. In his later years, Norton lived in poverty, and he died suddenly on the streets of San Francisco in 1880. Contrary to rumors, he was not wealthy, and his possessions included only a few dollars, a gold sovereign, and various headgear. His funeral, attended by a diverse crowd, reflected the city's respect and affection for the eccentric Emperor Norton. Today he is remembered as a unique and beloved figure in San Francisco's history, with various references to him in literature and popular culture. In the depths of the internet, a bizarre conspiracy theory has emerged suggesting that the vibrant network of human interaction we've come to know and love is nothing more than a facade, a lifeless wasteland secretly controlled by artificial intelligence. This idea, known as the dead internet theory, has gained traction among some online communities, who point to the increasing prevalence of AI-generated content as evidence that genuine human presence on the web is dwindling. Advocates of this theory contend that a significant portion of the content encountered online is actually the product of AI algorithms, and that even seemingly human-produced material is often the work of sophisticated bots. They propose that a cabal of influencers, bankrolled by powerful corporations and government entities, is orchestrating this silent takeover with the sinister goal of manipulating our thoughts and steering us towards consumerism. While the dead internet theory may seem far-fetched, it has struck a chord with certain users who perceive the internet as an increasingly bland and predictable space. They observe the same cyclical conversations and patterns of outrage playing out ad infinitum, leading them to question whether anything truly authentic remains. Yet, despite the presence of bots and AI-generated content, the reality is that the internet largely remains a realm of human interaction. The fact that this conspiracy theory has gained any traction at all, however, points to a profound sense of unease among some users regarding the trajectory of the web and the potential erosion of genuine human connection in the digital age. Inactivism is a position in cognitive science that argues cognition arises through a dynamic interaction between an acting organism and its environment. This theory suggests that the environment an organism inhabits is brought about, or enacted, by the active exercise of that organism's sensorimotor processes. In other words, living beings and their environments stand in relation to each other through mutual specification or co-determination. 
Proponents of inactivism maintain that organisms do not passively receive information from their environments, which they then translate into internal representations. Instead, natural cognitive systems participate in the generation of meaning by engaging in transformational interactions with their world. Some authors suggest that the increasing emphasis on inactive terminology presages a new era in thinking about cognitive science. Inactivism is closely related to situated cognition and embodied cognition, and is presented as an alternative to cognitivism, computationalism, and Cartesian dualism. It proposes that the self arises as part of the process of an embodied entity interacting with the environment in precise ways determined by its physiology. In this sense, individuals can be seen to grow into or arise from their interactive role with the world. One application of inactivism to perception is the analysis of the human hand. The many demanding uses of the hand are not learned by instruction, but through a history of engagements that lead to the acquisition of skills. It is suggested that the hand is an organ of cognition, not merely a subordinate working under top-down instruction, but a partner in a bidirectional interplay between manual and brain activity. Inactivism has also been applied to social cognition, suggesting that interaction processes can sometimes play constitutive roles in social cognition. This notion has led to research in social neuroscience and autism. In the field of education, inactivism is seen as a rich and powerful explanatory theory for learning and being, closely related to both Piaget's ideas of cognitive development and Vygotsky's social constructivism. Inactivism in education looks at each learning situation as a complex system consisting of teacher, learner, and context, all of which frame and co-create the learning situation. The concept of endless elevators has captured the human imagination for generations, with tales of these mysterious lifts extending deep into the earth, connecting to vast networks of underground tunnels and caverns. These stories have been perpetuated through urban folklore, with one notable proponent being a writer who chronicled a subterranean world filled with ancient ruins, reptilian creatures, and robotic entities in a popular science fiction magazine. There are few concrete explanations for what this phenomenon might represent. Some speculate that it could be an exaggeration of pit depth, elaborate hoaxes, or perhaps openings to undiscovered cave systems, clandestine military installations, ancient ruins, or even evidence of a hollow earth. Others propose that endless elevators might be a manifestation of an extreme or paranormal phenomenon, such as a wormhole or a portal to an alternate dimension or reality. Some even suggest that it could be a symbolic cognitive space, given the frequency with which this imagery appears in dreams. The specifics of endless elevator accounts vary considerably, from individuals claiming to have accessed subterranean realms via hidden elevators in abandoned structures, to those who have encountered the phenomenon in their dreams. Some of these tales are particularly disturbing, featuring reports of cannibalistic sadists and violence. The legend of endless elevators has also been linked to the Hypogeum, a massive three-level underground complex hewn from living rock. According to a decades-old article in a prominent geographic magazine, it was once possible to traverse the length of a certain island nation entirely underground, but the government sealed all entries following a tragic incident involving a school group that vanished during a field trip into these passages, never to be seen again. The Enneagram, a geometric figure featuring nine interconnected personality types, has been touted by some as a powerful tool for self-discovery and the attainment of higher states of consciousness. Proponents of this system believe that by delving into the intricacies of one's Enneagram type, individuals can cultivate a profound understanding of their own behaviors, motivations, and inner workings. Adherents of Enneagram-based spiritual practices suggest that through techniques such as meditation and self-reflection, one can harness the insights provided by this framework to unlock previously hidden aspects of the self and ultimately achieve a state of enlightenment. These practices often involve deep introspection and the exploration of the unconscious mind, guided by the wisdom of the Enneagram. However, the concept of Enneagram enlightenment remains a topic of debate and skepticism within both psychological and spiritual communities. 
Critics argue that the Enneagram lacks scientific rigor and empirical validation, casting doubt on its reliability as a tool for personal growth and transformation. Others maintain that the system oversimplifies the complex nature of human personality and spiritual development, failing to account for the myriad factors that contribute to an individual's journey toward self-realization. Despite the controversy surrounding Enneagram enlightenment, its proponents continue to advocate for its transformative potential, sharing anecdotal evidence of profound personal breakthroughs and spiritual awakenings. Detractors, on the other hand, caution against placing undue faith in a system that has yet to be fully substantiated by rigorous scientific inquiry. As the debate persists, the true efficacy of Enneagram enlightenment remains subjective. While some individuals wholeheartedly embrace this approach as a catalyst for spiritual growth, others remain unconvinced, viewing it as yet another unproven pathway in the ever-evolving landscape of personal development and self-discovery. Enochian is a mysterious language that was supposedly received from angels by two occultists in 16th century England. The language is integral to the practice of Enochian magic and is recorded in the private journals of those who claim to have received it. The Enochian language has a limited vocabulary of around 250 words, with more than half of these words appearing only once in the known texts. Some of the words resemble biblical names, but most have no apparent etymology. The grammar of Enochian is similar to English, with a scarcity of articles and prepositions. Adjectives are rare and typically precede the noun, as in English. Enochian texts were primarily recorded using the Latin alphabet, but a unique Enochian script also exists. The phonology of the language is essentially English, with a few challenging consonant and vowel combinations that resemble the kind of arbitrary patterns one might create by randomly combining letters. The available evidence suggests that Enochian verb conjugation is rudimentary and reminiscent of English, particularly the highly irregular verb, to be. Personal pronouns exist, but are used infrequently and in ways that can be difficult to comprehend. Enochian numerals from 0 to 10 can be identified, but larger numbers are written in an alphabetical form with no discernible system, making the numerical system largely inexplicable. Despite claims that Enochian is the original language spoken by Adam in Paradise, modern analysis indicates that it is a constructed language with strong similarities to English. The limited evidence of verb conjugation and word order closely follows English patterns, more so than ancient languages like Hebrew, which were said to be debased versions of Enochian, 